Hallelujah. In the crushing, we just sang that song, right? In the crushing, there's new wine, and new wine brings power, and kingdom, and refreshing. And so it's through our trials and tribulations that God begins to, you know, again, we don't, it's the valleys that we change, not the mountaintops. Amen. <laughs> so in that, there's a process that God brings us through. He calls it the potter's wheel. So it's counted all joys to go through, you know, trials and tribulations and challenges. Disappointments. Amen. And, and, and in that, God is always working something to the good. But see, so many times we don't realize that. And the enemy steps in and starts telling us all kinds of stuff of what we should have done, shouldn't have done, and all this other stuff. And sometimes he's right on some of those things. But we can't go there. We've got to go to the places where everything's going to work to the good as long as I cooperate. All right, I might have made a mistake. I might have done something. But God forgives, and his mercy is new every day, man. But we've got to shake that off quickly and move forward. Not move back. Amen? Because the moment you move back, the enemy takes over even more. Next thing you know, you're moving back two steps. Now, you gotta, now you're moving back two steps and you got to catch up four, you know? So what, what, what things are going on right now, we are, we are seeing a new wine that's going to be released. Everybody's getting in position. See, you... It, it, God doesn't tell you everything. He expects you to trust everything. Amen? And what's going on right now, he's trying to get us in position. And he doesn't want us to make emotional decisions. He doesn't want us to make decisions out of chaos. He wants us to follow what he says. And, and in this, there is what we call the mantle and the anointing. There's an, a mantle and an anointing. And, and, and a mantle is always associated with your call. Um, in other words, sometimes a mantle represents invitation. When you are, when you're associated with every ministry and, 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 and it has a mantle and anointing. And it's for a specific function and purpose. When God calls something to be done, he anoints it so it can be handled. That's why you might go to places and, and they'll say, well, wh who's your covering? In other words, who are you covered under? Well, that covering is associated as mantle. So when you're associated with this house, you're covered under the mantle. Does everybody understand that? And God releases an anointing so you can fulfill that call and purpose. In the First Kings in, uh, in chapter 19, hallelujah, and we've We've gone over some of this stuff already, but I, I just think we need a refreshing because we're, we're getting ready to get into. Hallelujah. 1 Kings 19 and verse 15. Now we're talking about Elijah, the prophet, who the Lord called, and he said, listen, I need you to go anoint some individuals. He's going to anoint two kings and a prophet. And in verse 15, would you read it with me? Then the Lord said to him, he said, go return to, on your way to the wilderness, of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazel as king over Syria. Also, you will anoint Jehu, the son of Namash, or as king over Israel. And Elijah, the son of Shaphat of Eba Mathal, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Hazel, Jehu will kill. And whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal. 
and every mouth that has not kissed him. So he departed from there, and he found Elisha, the son of Japheth, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him. And he, and, 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 and he was with the twelve. Then Elijah passed by and threw his what? Mantle on him. In other words, his call, his invitation. And he left the oxen and um, he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Please let me kiss my father and my mother, then I will follow you. And he said to him, Go back again for what have I done to you? In other words, he just got invited to serve God. Does everybody understand it? What have I done to you? So Elisha turned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slaughtered them and boiled their flesh using the oxen's equipment and gave it to the people. They ate. Then he arose and he fouled Elijah and became his what? His servant. So when the, he threw the mantle on him, he was saying, look at invitation. Invitation to fulfill a purpose. Now, when he went to him, he, he was soulish at first. He said, look at, let me go kiss mom and dad goodbye. And, you know, let me take care of my house and whatever. <laughs> and, and it was offensive to him. Why? Because how could you allow your family and all of the things according to the world's standard compared to what God's call is? Does everybody understand that? There was no comparison. And also because he had 12 oxen, his family was wealthy. They owned farmland and so forth. So he showed God. After Elijah said, oh man, what have I done to you? He went back and what did he do? He killed the oxen. He used the plow as a, a fire and offered it up. And then he went and followed. So what was he doing? He was cutting his bridges. He was cutting every bridge associated with him that would assist him. Does everybody get it? He was cutting everything. No more assistance from the worldly ways. No more assistance according to the carnal way. I'm going to trust God all the way who will provide for me now. I am no longer providing for myself. My provisions are not associated with the world. My provisions come from him. In other words, he is the source of all resources. Does everybody get it? Say it with me. The Lord is the source of all resources. See, so many times people put the resources before the source, and it causes problems. Hallelujah. All right. Now, just a little bit. So we see the, uh, uh, Elijah the prophet was to replace Elijah. Now, he goes over and he anoints Hazel as king. In other words, he anointed him with oil. He goes over and anoints Jehu with oil. But he throws the mantle on Elijah. Elisha. Does everybody get it? In other words, that mantle was a point of contact. It's a point of what? Contact. And in that point of contact, it's a point of contact to God's voice and access to heavenly kingdom. Now, before the activation, I call this the activation process. Even though God calls you to certain things, he first has to bring you through the process before he releases you. Amen? If you go before you are sent, you've left the mantle. You've walked away from it. Does everybody get it? When God brings you to the process of training for reigning and, and then sends you the mantles, he's sending you with the mantle, which is the connect. When you leave without the mantle... You're on your own. Does everybody get it? In other words, you're no longer covered in that anointing for that purpose. Is everybody okay? All right. Second, King, King, Second Kings chapter 2. In verse 1. Everybody there? Anybody there? Praise God. 
Let's speak this together. Now it came to pass when the Lord was about to take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now Gilgal is a place, you know, where there's sacrifice offerings. We call it the place of denial of self or death. <laughs> Does anybody understand? So he's going to bring Elisha to the three chambers of the tabernacle. Remember, everything revolves around the tabernacle, amen, and the feast. Okay. So Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me to Bethel. But Elijah uh, said to, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now, Bethel is associated with a place of house. Amen? Like Bethlehem, house of bread. It's, it's also known as the place where we have uh, battle. It's a place of battle. Remember, the first chambers of what? Deny yourself. Second is associated with battle. Amen? Where there's a priesthood. So they did worship, but they battled spiritually there. It was a spiritual battle. So Gilgal was a representation of denial of self. Bethel was a, uh, associated with the spiritual battle. Hallelujah. And he says, as the Lord li lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, do you know that your Lord will take away will take away your master from over you today and the master from over you today and he said yes I know what did he tell him keep quiet no, shut up man I don't need to hear this what was he doing he was shutting down any distractions any voices from anywhere else that was trying to mislead him amen in verse 4 then Elijah said to him Elisha Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me unto Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. Now, Jericho was in the place where they, the walls came down. Amen? <laughs> and and the, Jericho is known as access granted. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elijah and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from you today? So he answered and he said to them, Yes, I know. Keep quiet. I don't need to hear this. I don't need any distractions. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me on to the Jordan. What was he doing? Crossing over. Amen. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at the distance while the two of them stood at, by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water. And it divided this way and that. So the two of them crossed over on what? Dry ground. Remember, it was a place of crossover. Amen? So it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, ask. Why? Because he went through the training process. Do you understand? Now, he actually hung with him for over three years. So he was bringing him through this training process. He brought him through the process of the tabernacle. He brought him through these things. He was denying himself. He was spiritually battling. Amen? He was doing whatever it took. He would not let his eyes off of the one he was going to take place of. Is everybody okay? Hallelujah. Now, this comes, this happens, it's powerful. So when he said, so when the, after they crossed over, he says, ask. Okay, now ask, what do you need? What do you want? See, there are things that people are asking and they haven't deserved it yet. And we say, well, God says we can have all things. Yes, but there are things he's not going to release until you've earned it. Amen? 
See, favor is earned. <laughs> Amen. Trust is earned. All of these things, there's an earning process. That's why cooperation is essential. He will bring us through. He knows exactly what we need. Always. But he'll prepare you to fulfill that need. Amen? So what does he say? He says, well, ask what you want. What can I do for you? For I am taken up from you. Elisha said, please let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. So he said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if you see me when I am taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if not... It shall not be so. You think his eyes were on him constantly? Man, he probably slept next to him. He probably held him. I'm not letting this dude go, man. I want the whole portion of what he's got. Then it happened as they continued on and talked that suddenly a chariot of fire appeared with the horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah, Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elijah saw it. And he cried out, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own claws and he tore them into pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him. And went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him. And struck the water and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elisha crossed over. Now, again, he went through the process to get activated. Everyone say activated. <laughs> so what was being activated? The mantle and the anointing. It was being activated. See, so many times people are trying to move without activation. Because they haven't gone through the process. Does everybody get this? Praise God. Acts chapter 19. Acts 19 verse 11. Let's speak it. Now God worked unusual miracles by the hands of Paul. <clears throat> so that even handkerchiefs. Or aprons were brought from his body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and evil spirits went out of them. Now, the handkerchiefs and aprons were mantles. They were a point of contact. Does everybody understand that? But it wasn't about, what was it for? It was a point of contact for what? Healing and deliverance was bringing God's what? Anointing. Amen? It was bringing God's what? Anointing. Amen. And, um... Then, uh, let's see, oh, wait, verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists took it upon themselves to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, we exorcise you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. Did they have the anointing? Did they have the mantle? No. They had no covering, did they? Also, there were seven sons of Sceviea, a Jewish chief priest who did so. And the seven spirit and the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. These demons kicked their butt, trying to imitate Jesus. Amen. And this became known both to all Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. <clears throat> and fear fell on them, and the name of the Lord was magnified. <laughs> Again, the mantle called, the man, mantle called to be activated to fulfill the calling and the anointing. The mantle here was a point of contact to the anointing as handkerchiefs and aprons went out. Again, the mantle represents a cover or, or backing from heaven and a point of contact. And we notice that the mantle was always used in the Old Testament. Amen? You don't see it so much in the New Testament because now it's understood. And, 
that the mantle is also associated with the anointing together now. But at one time it was separated. But there's still a spiritual mantle for me and you. There's still a spiritual mantle. And in that it is our covering. Amen. Now we know that the Holy Spirit is the eternal keeper of all things. But see, you can have, you can have the Holy Spirit in you but not be baptized with the Holy Spirit yet. There's a difference. Amen. Because see, there's the Holy Spirit that comes upon you in the baptism for service. To serve God. And when that mantle comes or that anointing comes, you know it. And it's to serve God. But when it doesn't come, you don't want to lay hands on someone because then you're doing it in the flesh. Is everybody okay? Now, it doesn't mean you, can, you can't pray with someone. Amen. But you don't have to lay hands on someone to pray for someone. Hallelujah. Praise God. So the anointing in the New Testament is through the price of Christ and his blood. We, are, we, are, we now carry the mantle and the anointing together through the blood of Jesus Christ. In Exodus 28. Glory. Exodus 28, verse 1 through 4. Let's speak it. Now It says, Now take Aaron your brother and his sons with them from among the children of Israel that he may minister to me as a what? As a priest. Aaron and Aaron's sons, Nabed, Abihu, Elazar, and Ethamar. And you will make holy what? Garments for Aaron your brother for glory and for beauty. And you shall speak to all who are gifted artisans, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister to me as a priest. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, skillfully woven tunic, turban, hash, sash, so that they shall make holy garments for Aaron your brother and his sons, and that they may minister to me. These are priestly garments. These garments are also known as a mantle. Somebody get it? The mantle of anointing to minister to the Lord, also known as a second chamber of the tabernacle. Because the second chamber of the tabernacle is called the priestly anointing. The first chamber is the salvation anointing. Amen? Then you have the third chamber, which is the kingly anointing or warrior anointing. In Isaiah 61.10, Isaiah 61, verse 10. Is everybody there? Hallelujah. Let's speak it together. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Is anybody there? 61. 61, 10. Oh, 61, 10. Sorry. I'm in verse 1. Sorry. I needed a zero there. 61 10. Let's go. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the gar garments of what? What chamber is that? Outer court. Amen. Praise God. He has covered me with a robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself with ornaments. As a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its bud, as the garden causes the things that are sown in it to spring forth, so the Lord God will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all the nations. Again, we see here the garment of salvation, which is the mantle of salvation, the first chamber. And Luke chapter 4. You may think that... Uh, God isn't training you. He's training you wherever you're going, wherever you are. <laughs> you are. You could be at work, you know. You could be anywhere. Everything is challenged and trained. 
We go through trials. We go through disappointments. We go through everything. And uh, you, it, you're just not going to go through it if you're sitting home in your bedroom twiddling your thumbs. There's no training in twiddling your thumbs. Amen. People think, well, I'm denying myself. No, you're promoting yourself. Get the heck out of there. <laughs> and let God kill you some more. Praise God. Luke 4, verse uh, 16. Luke 4, verse 16. Let's speak it together. So Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And when he was handing the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had, had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. It says he found the place, so he was looking for the scripture. The Spirit, and then he spoke, and he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel of the poor. Now, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Is that the mantle? Yes. Because he's what? Anointed me. So that's the mantle and the anointing. To what? Preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who were oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book, he gave it back to the attendant, and sat down, and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Wow. In other words, the anointed one and his anointing, the mantle, and the anointing of God Almighty, God himself, he come into this realm. Amen? The Spirit of the Lord is the ma uh, mantle from heaven, come with the eternal presence. Remember, the anointing is the eternal presence, power and truth of God Almighty. Say it with me. The anointing is the eternal presence, power and truth of God Almighty. Because <clears throat> the anointing is used to serve. There's an anointing that keeps me in you. That's through the Holy Spirit. But there is an anointing that comes upon you to serve. And it causes miracles, signs, and wonders, and so forth. Hello? Praise God. In Isaiah 61, let's try this again. Is everybody there? first three verses it says it here so what he was speaking the spirit of the lord god is upon me because the lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the lord now he goes further isaiah prophesies further on this and the day of vengeance of our god to comfort all who mourn to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of what? Righteousness. The planting of the Lord, that he may be what? Glorified. So remember, trees associated with your a spirit, so that we may be spirits of what? Righteousness. Amen? Is everybody okay? This is the mantle. The anointing. Isaiah 10. See, so many times people try to step in an anointing God's not called them to. And uh, it doesn't work. In verse 27. Isaiah 10, verse 27, let's speak it. And it shall come to pass that in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck. And the yoke will be destroyed because of the what? The anointing oil, or what we call the, the yoke destroying anointing. It destroys, breaks every yoke of bondage. Do you remember the oil? Again, we called the anointing oil here is a point of contact. Amen? Jesus, now think about this. Jesus was wrapped 
and we talked about this the other day, Jesus was wrapped in waddling clothes, right? Cloths. To be preserved because of the blemish free lamb. Amen. It was with the same the priests used to, the shepherds did. They looked for that lamb that was blemish free. They would take their wrap it, make sure it stayed blemish. And it wasn't put in a manger, it was put in a trough, a trough, you know. And the same that same wrapping for Jesus was the anoint the mantle. Does everybody get this? They, he was God wrapped him. He was, it was the mantle, it was his call and purpose that he was going to fulfill. Remember when he was brought in to be circumcised, and the prophet came and spoke about to Mary and said that, you know, there would be a sword that would pierce your heart. He spoke all of these things, but Jesus was protected because he was covered by the what? The mantle. The mantle of God. Amen? Now, Jesus was wrapped with the mantle covered by heaven to, to break all, all those who were in bondage of darkness. And we, set, we spoke it right here. He opened up the prison doors and so forth. Why? Because the only way to break it is with the anointing of Christ, which is the presence and power and truth of God Almighty, the anointing. Each office in the body and ministry has a spe special mantle, specific one, an anointing. In other words... You know, when somebody, I, and I've shared this already before, you know, sometimes somebody goes, well, who's your covering? Who's your covering? You know, I, I had no covering at first because I wasn't, I wasn't involved in a church. I had a visitation from the Lord. So when said, somebody said to me, who's your covering? I said, Jesus. Of course, he's all of our coverings. Amen. But people are really not covered until they're covered. So when you become a Christian, you want to get into that place where you are covered. And then when the anointing, the mantle comes upon you, you are covered by the throne of God. And the anointing is out to fulfill the calling and purpose with power, the presence of God, and the truth of God. We're no longer doing things according to the way we want to do them. We're no longer doing things according to the carnal. We're doing things according to the spirit. We're being led by the spirit. To fulfill the mantle calling, we're covered, we're protected, we're connected. Now the anointing is carrying us to whatever we need to do. Does everybody get this? Cool. All right. I'm telling you we're entering a whole nother season coming. I, I really believe that through the crushing, I mean, look at what the whole world's going through. So like God's got his hand on the world going. <laughs> Probably playing basketball with it. I don't know. Yeah. But things are changing. The whole world is under distress. The whole world's gone nuts. <laughs> Except for those that are covered. When you're covered, there's no problem, man. Amen. When you're covered, there's no problem. It's so be it. What do you want me to do, Lord? <laughs> Hallelujah. But I really believe that in this crushing and changing, there is going to be that early and later rain, that new wine is coming out with more kingdom, more power, more unity, and more destruction of Satan's kingdom. Because the only thing that can destroy Satan's kingdom is the anointing. Hebrews chapter 10. Hallelujah. Hebrews 10 and verse 26. Let's speak it together. If we what? If we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice or a what? Covering. Does everybody see this? There no longer remains a covering. 
if there's no more sacrifice for sin, there's no more covering. Amen? Somebody who willfully sins, that covering, that mantle is lifted. 27. But a certain fearful what? Expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, and I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. Now he's talking about his own people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a, the living God. But recall the former days in which you were illuminated. You endured a great struggle with sufferings. Partially while you were made a spectacle, both by reproaches and tribulations, and partly while you became companions of those who were so treated. For you had compassion on me, and my change and joyfully accepted the plundering of your goods, knowing that you have a better and an enduring possession for yourselves in heaven. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of what? <clears throat> endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the what? Promise. See, so many people want to receive the promise without being doing the will of God. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just live by faith, but if anyone draws back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not those who draw back to perdition, but those who believe in the saving of the soul. Remember, when somebody willfully sins, there's no covering or mantle of protection. And the Bible says the wages of sin is what? Death. Amen. First John chapter 2. Is rebellion sin? Does rebellion bring a curse? Yes, so does sin. <laughs> First John 15. First John chapter 2, 15. Glory. Let's speak it. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God does what? Abides forever. Little children, is the last hour, and if you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know it's the last hour. And I've shared before, you can turn any newscast on, you can, there's the Antichrist, I'm telling you. They're just promoting it, promoting it, promoting it. It's all Antichrist doctrine. You hear it all over the place. This, uh, all of these plagues and pestilence and stuff is Antichrist doctrine. Now many people have taken the mark of the beast. It's one of the marks. They've been injected with a marker. And it's changing them. They don't realize it. But hallelujah. They, they will find out soon. It says here that... Uh, Verse 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest, and that none of them were of us. <clears throat> but you have an anointing one and from the Holy One, and you know what? Oh, snap, you know all things. I have not written to you because you don't know the truth, but because you do know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the anointed one and is anointing Christ. He is an antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning. <clears throat> if what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you shall also abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that he has promised us, eternal life. That's that if we abide. <clears throat> These things I want have written to you, Concerning those who try to deceive you or distract you and move you out of position. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teach you. 
But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. Now, the anointing that abides in us, that's the quickening of the Holy Spirit. Again, there's a, tar, a part and time when the Holy Spirit will also come upon you for power and service. I can't tell you how many times I've sensed the Holy Spirit come upon me and then boom, prophesied or whatever. Or uh, there's a seven, in fact, I want to go there for a second. Go to Isaiah, um, I think it's chapter 11. Isaiah 11. Yeah. In verse 1 and 2. And it says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, who is David's father. And a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Is that the mantle? Yes. The Spirit of what? Wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. These are the seven attributes of the Holy Spirit. I, I can tell you that I felt, and, 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 and people that were around me when this occurred, the fear of God came on them. I was... Uh, I was I was young in the Lord and and I was doing something and I had to go into Ki, what's it called Kikos or Kinkos or whatever it is a copy place and so I went and ordered something and I was walking in there to uh, I I happened to go and I got to the front I was walking to the front door and all of a sudden the Spirit of the Lord came out in me Woo, the anointing came in I thought oh my gosh and. And I walked in there, and the place was kind of like shut down. They had a mini flood. And, and there were people sitting around a round table, like kind of like just talking and eating lunch. And uh, I went in there and asked, you know, do they have my order? And there was a person there that said some smart, wise remark. I didn't have to say a word. I'm telling you, I just stood there and I could sense the spirit of might that was so strong on me. When the person looked to me, looked at me, turned their head, and everyone at that table turned their heads. And I just turned around and walked out because I could have tore everybody out. I'm telling you, I could have thrown every single one of them out of that building. I could have pulled that building down if I had to. That's how powerful and strong the presence of God was. I left that place. When I walked out three steps after that, the anointing lift, and I said, Dear God, Lord, I like that. <laughs> Too bad it didn't come when I was playing football, you know? <laughs> I could have ran through the goalposts. <laughs> But anyways, but there's the seven attributes of the Holy Spirit that come upon us. Even to prophesy and so forth. There's that you know the Holy Spirit is. People are doing too many things in the flesh and not being led in the Spirit. They're not waiting for the presence of God to come and move. They move before God's presence. And it causes problems. Can God trust someone that moves before God's presence? No. That many believers are still living their life trying to earn God's presence, God's favor, and never have because they're always moving before God comes. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Anyways, go to John chapter 20. John 20. Hallelujah. In verse 16. 
Now Jesus raises from the dead. And Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him, Rabbi, or yeah, teacher. Jesus said to her, do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. You got to remember now, Mary was a prostitute. Amen. This is not Jesus' mother. So they weren't going to take so much, even though she had gotten born again, saved and everything, you know. But they were still, to them, they were, she was incredible. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst. See, they were more fearful of the Jews than they were of the Roman Empire. No. For fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. His disciples were glad when they had saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now you got to remember, Jesus breathed the Holy Spirit. He was actually breathing the mantle on them to cover them. Because the Holy Spirit hadn't been poured out with the baptism for power. Does everybody understand it? In other words, the, the anoint the mantle was coming first, then the anointing was coming. Does everybody got this? That's what Pentecost was. It was a release of the anointing. But Jesus breathed upon them the mantle. Is everybody okay? Hallelujah. Ephesians 4. And then one more scripture. Ephesians 4, verse 25. Hallelujah. Let's speak it together. Therefore, putting away lying, let each of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands, what is good that he may have something to give him who is in need. And let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not what? Grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were what? Sealed. That word sealed is associated with mantled. For the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Or make place for the devil. Amen. Second Corinthians one fifteen. Second Corinthians one, verse fifteen. And in this confidence, I intend to come to you before that you might have a second benefit to pass by way of, of you in Macedonia, to come again from Macedonia to you and be helped by you on the way to Judea. Therefore, when I also plan, planning this, did I do it lightly or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh that with me there should be Yes, yes, and no, no. But as God is faithful, 
our word to you was not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me, Selvius, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him yes. For all the promise of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ Jesus and anointed us is God. Who also has what? Sealed us with, and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. Moreover, I call as witnesses against my soul that to spare you I came no more to Corinth. Not that we have dominion over your faith, but our fellow workers for your joy, for by faith you stand. So he says here, we were established by God and Christ with the anointing and we were sealed by him. And it's the guarantee of the Spirit of God. That seal again is a representation of the mantle, the call, the purpose. Amen. So we see that the mantle and the anointing, it's good to understand this. It's good to be covered. It's good to be protected. And it's good to not grieve the Holy Spirit. Amen. Or sin uh, willfully. Hallelujah. Praise God. We thank you for your word, my Lord. We ask tonight's teaching be imparted. All the words that have been released be imparted each and every one of us. Bring to remembrance that we may walk in the, in the covering of the mantle and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That we may be available, yield to you in all things, willing to do whatever it takes at any time, and willing to be trained all the way through and be sent in your name, in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Praise God. Give somebody a hug tonight and say, you got it, man.